Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzle loading, and today we're looking at this original Jacob Albright silver accented American long rifle. This rifle is attributed to Jacob Albright of what is now Center County, Pennsylvania. This rifle is number 71 in Kindig's Thoughts on the Kentucky Rifle in its Golden Age and has similar carving to other rifles that we know are attributed to Jacob Albright. It has a rare adjustable single set trigger, light engraving on the patch box, incised lines terminating in light scroll carving on the forend with 19 silver accents. Whenever I have the opportunity to pull out a rifle that was featured in one of Kindig's books, I try to do so, if nothing more than for my own personal intrigue and interest. A lot of times that collection, after it was split out of the Kindig collection, is, is hard to see publicly. So I hope that this is an interesting look for fans of, of Albright, fans of Kindig, and, and muzzleloading enthusiasts in general. I'd say personally this is a very good example of a Pennsylvania style long rifle. Notably here we can kind of see a distinct uh, change in long rifle construction uh, really attributed to the Pennsylvania regions uh, with this swooped style buttstock here. A lot of earlier and maybe Virginia, Kentucky style guns have a much more pronounced crest here and uh, without this kind of droop or swoop going down in the buttstock. But that's something we see very prevalent here. I just want to make a note of. This rifle is a 45 caliber as Rock Island has measured it, but I want to say the barrel is a very heavy bore. Picking this up, we are very front end heavy here, but as we align with the buttstock, kind of falls into place and lines right up in kind of the natural long rifle way that I, I discuss and I love so much. Apart from these silver inlay pieces, the rest of our hardware is brass. So we have a brass butt plate here and a brass multiple piece patch box here. The patch box is opened by a small stud here in the toe plate. The toe plate is held on with two screws. Our patch box isn't extremely decorated here, but we do have some light engraving lines. Something I love about this era of engraving is how light it is. And on an aged patch box like this, it's almost worn out across the sides here where a hand or a bag might be rubbing up against this brass. The top finial here comes to a sharp kind of spear point with a couple petals here. It's hard to tell. I don't think the screws are engraved, but they are again worn uh, quite a bit here, so it could be hard to tell. We have three screws holding in the front end of our patch box here, and we have four nails or tacks holding together the side panels to our patch box here. Our patch box is activated by this button here on the toe plate. I have actuated it a couple times and I will say the spring is just about worn out uh, through use over the years, which I think is a really neat, really neat uh, little tidbit there that these, you know, this rifle saw some use, it was carried, it was used. Uh, it's something I just love about these early American long rifles. On the top of our crest here, we have an oval silver accent here. And then we have another silver accent thumb piece here on our wrist. Forward of our patch box a few inches here, we have kind of a, a, a cap really to our lock mortise here inlaid. There was silver held together with a single tack. And then we have a double curved shape here as well, tacked on with a single tack, just atop of our trigger guard. Our trigger guard is a very traditional brass trigger guard here. It has some filed facets. And in this primary swoop where our hand would be held, any leftover filing marks here are just about worn out. We can feel a single ridge there in the center, but anything on either side has been totally worn. The trigger guard is held together with two pins. We can see back here at the rear of the trigger guard, the single pin, then I believe the forward end of the trigger guard is held in with a pin connected and, and kind of hidden behind our lock. We can see it here on the side plate side on the other side. The neat thing about this rifle really is this adjustable single trigger. So this is some documentation. This is a source that they did have single adjustable triggers. Our lock, as noted in the description, has some light engraving on here. Not really any scenes, but we again have some wave line borders and then some kind of sunbursts coming off of the main cock screw, as well as the ends of the screws holding the lock into the stock. Our frizzen spring has been lost to time here. Uh, it has been broken, but the rest of the lock here seems to be complete and intact. Coming forward of our lock mortise here, we have a silver crescent moon with the typical face or nose cut into that inlay. Just underneath that moon, 
which has a companion mirrored on the other side of the stock. We have a bald brass head held together in with five small tacks. One of the tacks really in the right place to indicate an eye, which I think is a nice little decoration. Our barrel has a simple tang held in with a single tang bolt here. We have a nice kind of cut finial to this tang that extends about halfway back to our silver thumb piece. Coming forward from our crescent moon in the stock, we have a half circle here inlaid into the stock just behind our first barrel key. Forward of our first barrel key, we have our ramrod entry pipe. It is also brass with some light filed decoration. Coming off of that, we have some nice incised line carvings, beautiful scroll work here, just uh, kind of lining up very well with our idea of the golden mean and, and the arcs and those curves there that are just aesthetically pleasing to the eye. I wanna to jump to our entry pipe here because it is also a little worn. Kind of the bottom face of this has been crunched a little bit and is worn out, whether through uh, how it was carried or, or maybe just the amount of ramrod usage going through the era. We have a, a wedding band at the front and at the rear of the entry pipe. And the face itself of the pipe that goes back into the stock is pretty flat, pretty flush. Um, no, I mean that in no decoration, no molding or anything on that piece of hardware. The carving for the entry pipe is exclusively on either side of the entry pipe, nothing on the bottom of the stock. And that same incised carving line here on the side of the stock lines up and connects with one of the pins holding in our entry pipe and runs forward and turns into the molding line for our ramrod channel. This molding line extends up to the muzzle and to the nose cap of this rifle and intersects with each of the barrel keys and pins that hold in the ramrod pipes. The inside carving line also seems to serve as a gauge or a marker for two more crescent or, or half circle silver inlays, each held in with a single tack. In total, we have three barrel keys holding this barrel to the stock and coming up to our nose cap, we have a brass nose cap, it looks like here, uh, about an inch and three quarters to two inches in length, wrapping all the way around the muzzle of this stock. I presume this to be a curly maple stock, just based on the color and the way that the grain works. It is a pretty highly figured stock. I'm not gonna say this would be an extra fancy stock in today's terms, but it is, it is fancy the whole way through and, and exhibits some beautiful curl. Our sight system for this rifle is very low profile. We have an iron rear sight about a third of the way up the barrel here. I can indicate it here from the lock towards the muzzle. And then our front sight is about an inch and an inch and a half or so from the end of our muzzle. This brass front sight is very low profile, much like I talk about a lot in these original long rifles. Our sights are very low, right on deck, so to speak, for the rifle. And there is a, a few engraving cut lines at an angle kind of angling back towards the user of this rifle. Flipping around to our side plate side here, starting from our muzzle working back, we have kind of the mirror to the partner side of the rest of the rifle here. Our three barrel keys have brass heads on them, kind of adding a nice accent, kind of flowing with, we'll say, the rest of the brass hardware being the side plate, trigger guard, butt plate, and ramrod pipes. We have a matching molding line starting with the muzzle working back to our entry pipe. And very similar curves and scrolls here with a couple little floral patterns there and carved into the stock. Our side plate is made of brass and it's fairly ornate. We have a termination with a flat rectangular face here at the front at our first lock bolt and a couple flowing curves coming back to our second lock bolt. These lock bolts are very spherical in nature. They're not flattened at all and are very bulbous. Much like the rest of this rifle here, our side plate mortise is feeling its age, showing some wear. The side plate is, is scratched up a little bit. And I wonder just with how it is, how it is scratched up, if it was carried near something on a belt maybe uh, to scuff this up a little bit. This is another neat indication of, of an original rifle here like we have being used and being carried. Um, I just, I love that about these original pieces. As much as they are art to us today, and, and as Mel Hankel would say, a backbone to American art and culture, especially for this time period, they were tools, they were utilitarian. And we see that with this rifle. As we come back to the cheek rest face of our buttstock, we have some beautiful silver inlays here and a very shallow cheek rest here. On many of these, we have a very defined, very crisp, 
cheek rest, but this one is very shallow into the stock, whether through wear or design is hard to tell at this, in this era, we'll say. On top of our cheek rest, we have three silver inlays. We have a typical Star of Bethlehem, I will call it, and flanked by two faced or nosed crescent moons. The underside of our cheek rest, we have another silver plate held in with three tacks. We have a beautiful molding line coming back from our trigger guard back to our toe plate, and this is present on both sides. But really where this rifle starts to sing is this carving here behind our cheek rest. Here we have a beautifully carved JA surrounded by some just beautiful carving here. We have several scrolls coming off of our lettering, several floral motifs. I mean, this is just really beautiful carving, I think. It it's, might not be the most stellar, most pristine condition American long rifle from this era that we've seen, but this carving back here is just really gorgeous. And this is the kind of stuff that really just makes an American long rifle pop, I think. It's just, it's this great little carving. Coming off of the A, we have several petals and scrolls. Flowing up through here, we have a beautiful four flowered leaf with a couple other lines and leaf patterns coming off the top. Just beautiful, beautiful calligraphy here transferred into carving. I want to zoom out here and talk about this rifle at a whole. Fans or, or enthusiasts of American long rifles might recognize a lot of these silver inlays and their positions as things that we see in kind of the percussion era. When we start to get into Indiana and Ohio American long rifles, we start to see this addition of silver inlays all through the stock. We get away from kind of the plain elegance of the American long rifle. And uh, in the percussion era, we just start adding these silver inlays. When we think about Jacob Albright as a gunsmith, he was born and kind of came into his own really seeing that era as it came. Born in 1768, he lived until 1840. So he would have been alive and would have been working in that era where we started to add these silver inlays. And I think this can represent possibly an early example of that for the American long rifle, of adding these silver inlays all through the stock in what would kind of be considered you know, odd positions maybe if you're a fan of earlier long rifles. But this is a really neat intermediary, I would say, between the flintlock and the percussion era, both because of the construction and then artistically for this rifle. Because we have these silver inlays, we still have a flintlock ignition. We still have a long barrel assembly here, but this is kind of in between there before we get into the percussion era, which I think is just really neat. It's something that we don't see a whole lot of. And when we see and find these kind of in between or or hybridized or transitionary era long rifles. I think it's neat to get them out and talk about them and look at them. You'll see uh, a lot of things emulated both in earlier rifles and with later rifles when you take a look at this one. So I encourage you, if you're interested in a rifle like this, please look at some of the earlier influences, perhaps by some of Jacob's mentors or educators, and then see some of the later influences. In kind of the 1810s, 1820s, we start to really see this addition of silver inlay through these rifles. So I think that's really neat. Um, I hope that you do as well. These kind of transitionary era rifles, um, you know, it's kind of a soft spot in my heart. They're kind of weird, kind of different, but uh, they're neat nonetheless. All in all, for me, this is a really neat look at original American long rifles and, and American firearms history, I think. Um, I have a soft spot in my heart for those intermediary guns and then the later Indiana, Ohio guns because of my family tree. But I hope that you've enjoyed taking a look at this original Jacob Albright with me here today. If you'd like to learn more about this piece or any of the other pieces I look at here at the Rock Island Auction Company, I encourage you to look at the Rock Island Auction Company social media pages. They post a ton of high quality photos and videos with a lot of neat historical research to go along with it for you to check out and for you to learn from. I think it's really neat that they put this stuff out for free and, and allow folks like me to come in here and at least do our best really to show you some of these original works of art. I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next time. Some light engraving on the lock has, <laughs> and his publications.